the service in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Please stand as we sing our first hymn, hymn number 373. Beloved in the Lord, let us draw near with a true heart and confess our sins unto God our Father, beseeching him in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ to grant us forgiveness. Our help is in the name of the Lord. Who made heaven and earth. I said I will confess my transgressions unto the Lord. Forgave the iniquity of my sin. Almighty God, our Maker and Redeemer, we poor sinners confess unto you that we are by nature sinful and unclean, and that we have sinned against you by thought, word, and deed. Whereupon we come for refuge to your infinite mercy, seeking and imploring your grace for the sake of our Lord Jesus Christ. O oh, most merciful God, who has given his only begotten Son to die for us. Have mercy upon us, and for his sake, grant us remission of all our sins, and by your Holy Spirit, increase in us true knowledge of you and of your will, and true obedience to your word, that by your grace we may come to lasting life, through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Almighty God, our Heavenly Father, has had mercy upon us and has given his only Son to die for us, 
and for his sake forgives us all our sins. To them that believe on his name, he gives power to become the sons of God and bestows on them his Holy Spirit. He that believes and is baptized shall be saved. Grant this, O Lord, unto us all. Amen. Glory be to the Father, and to the Son, and to the Holy Ghost, as it was in the beginning, is now, and ever shall be, world without end. Amen. You may be seated. first lesson for today comes from 1 Samuel 7, verses 5 through 12, and that can be found on page 428 of your pew Bible. It's 1 Samuel chapter 7, verses 5 through 12. Then Samuel said, Assemble all Israel at Mizpah, and I will intercede with the Lord for you. When they had assembled at Mizpah, they drew water and poured it out before the Lord. On that day they fasted, and, they were, and there they confessed, We have sinned against the Lord, and Samuel was leader of Israel at Mizpah. When the Philistines heard that Israel had assembled at Mizpah, the rulers of the Philistines came up to attack them. And when the Israelites heard of it, they were afraid because of the Philistines. They said to Samuel, Do not stop crying out to the Lord our God for us, that he may rescue us from the hand of the Philistines. Then Samuel took a suckling lamb and offered it up as a whole burnt offering to the Lord. He cried out to the Lord on Israel's behalf, and the Lord answered him. While Samuel was sacrificing the burnt offering, the Philistines drew near to engage Israel in battle, but that day the Lord thundered with loud thunder against the Philistines and threw them into such a panic that they were routed before the Israelites. The men of Israel rushed out to Mizpah and pursued the Philistines, slaughtering them along the way to a point below Bethkar. Then Samuel took a stone and set it up between Mizpah and Shen. He named it Ebenezer, saying, Thus far has the Lord helped us. This ends the first lesson. Second lesson comes from Romans chapter 6, verses 1 through 23. And that can be found on page 1754 of your Pew Bible. Romans chapter 6, verses 1 through 23. It's titled, Dead to Sin, Alive in Christ. What shall we say then? Shall we go on sinning so that grace may increase? By no means. We died to sin. How can we live, it, live in it any longer? For don't you know that all of us who were baptized into Christ Jesus were baptized into his death? We were therefore buried with him through baptism into death in order that, just as Christ was raised from the dead, to the glory of the Father, we too may live a new life. If we have been united with him like this in his death, we will certainly be also united with him in his resurrection. For we know that our old self was crucified with him so that the body of sin might be done away with, that we should no longer be slaves to sin, because anyone who has died has been freed from sin. Now if we died in Christ, we believe that we will also live with him. For we know that since Christ was raised from the dead, he cannot die again. Death no longer has mastery over him. The death he died, he died to sin once for all. But the life he lives, he lives to God. In the same way, count yourselves dead to sin, but alive to God in Christ Jesus. Therefore, do not let sin reign in your mortal body, so that you obey its evil desires. 
Do not offer the parts of your body to sin as instruments of wickedness, but rather offer yourselves to God as those who have been brought from death to life and offer the parts of your body to him as instruments of righteousness. For sin shall not be your master, because you are not under law, but under grace. What then? Shall we sin because we are not under the law, but under grace? By no means. Don't you know that when you offer yourselves to someone to obey him as slaves, you are slaves to the one whom you obey, whether you are slaves to sin, which leads to death, or to obedience, which leads to righteousness? But thanks be to God, though you, used to, though you used to be slaves to sin, you wholeheartedly obeyed the form of teaching to which you were entrusted. You have been set free from sin and have become slaves to righteousness. I put this in human terms because you are weak in your natural selves, just as you used to offer the parts of your body in slavery to impurity and to ever-increasing wickedness, so now offer them in slavery to righteousness, leading to holiness. When you are slaves to sin, you are free from the control of righteousness. What benefit did you reap at that time from the things you are now ashamed of? Those things result in death. But now that you have been set free from sin and have become slaves to God, the benefit you reap leads to holiness, and the result is eternal life. For the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life in Christ Jesus our Lord. This ends the second lesson. This morning's gospel reading comes from the book of Matthew, chapter 21, verses 28 through 32. Please rise as you, out of respect for God's word. Glory be to thee, O Lord. Matthew chapter 21, verses 28 through 32, and that's found on 1533. Beginning at verse 28. The parable of the two sons. What do you think? There was a man who had two sons. He went to the first and said, Son, go and work today at the vineyard. I will not, he answered. But later he changed his mind and went. Then the father went to the other son and said, to the, same, said the same thing. He answered, I will, sir. But he did not go. Which of the two did what his father wanted? The first, they answered. Jesus said to them, I tell you the truth, the, ta the tax collectors and the prostitutes are entering the kingdom of God ahead of you. For John came to you to show you the way of righteousness, and you did not believe him, but the tax collectors and the prostitutes did. And even after you saw this, you did not repent and believe. Here is the gospel reading for this morning. Praise be to thee, O Christ. On page 32, you can follow along and as we uh, share our common faith in the words of the Apostle Creed. I believe in God the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Ghost, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, dead, and buried. He descended into hell. The third day rose again from the dead. He ascended into heaven and is seated on the right hand of God the Father Almighty, where he shall come to judge the living and dead. I believe in the Holy Ghost, the Holy Christian Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. You may be seated as we prepare for Pastor Hart's uh, message. Uh, we will sing uh, number 295.
Good morning. Good morning. Uh, it's good to be here as we begin another week. A um, couple of things I want to mention. Karen told me that she had written something up. She's sharing it with friends, and so that includes you all. About It's kind of her testimony of God's faithfulness during this last year and, an, and a half. So you'll see it on the table back there. I left it for y'all. Okay, so look at that if you like, because God is faithful. And the other thing I'd like to mention to you all is that Wednesday, um, Sarah's going to be going into the hospital, my daughter-in-law, and she's going to be having that baby either Wednesday or Thursday this week. So I'm not distracted at all. I think we're down to about 80 hours now. Yeah, 80 hours, 14 minutes, no. <laughs> Anyway, so I know I'll be praying, but it's going to be, I'll probably have some good news next, next week. So um, we're going to turn to God's word. And so I'd invite you to stand out of respect for his word. And let's turn to Matthew chapter 15. And I'll begin at verse 21. So again, uh, your pew Bible is that's found on, uh, found on page 1522. So Matthew chapter 15, beginning with verse 21. Leaving that place, Jesus withdrew to the region of Tyre and Sidon. A Canaanite woman from that vicinity came to him, crying out, Lord, son of David, have mercy on me. My daughter is suffering terribly from demon possession. Jesus did not answer a word. So his disciples came to him and urged him, Send her away, for she keeps crying out after us. He answered, I was sent only to the lost sheep of Israel. The woman came and knelt before him, Lord, help me, she said. He replied, It is not right to take the children's bread and toss it to their dogs. Yes, Lord, she said, but even the dogs eat the crumbs that fall from their master's table. Then Jesus answered, Woman, you have great faith. Your request is granted. And her daughter was healed from that very hour. This is the true word of God. Let us pray. Heavenly Father, thank you for the words that you have for people then and for people now. Thank you that you are not a God who remains silent. Thank you because your word is so good. Your word shows us the way of life, the way of forgiveness, the way of mercy. Open our minds, our souls, our voices to your word, Father, as it testifies to your Son, Jesus Christ. In his name we pray. Amen. You may be seated. Well, you know, if there had been anybody who had figured out how to make a radio on their own way back in the 1800s or earlier than that, there would be nothing to listen to, just static, which I find boring. No voices, no sports, no music, because people hadn't figured out how to transmit those signals. Or today, scientists are pointing all sorts of different types of enormous telescopes at the skies, some to see and some to hear, anything that's out there. You know, they've actually heard, I mean, scientists who aren't Christians, some are, some aren't, but they t say that they actually can hear the stars singing. Interesting. They've heard a hum, a strange hum that fills the galaxy, and I can't explain it. But no voices, no music, no signs that there's anybody out there. None of this technology, even today, can pick up the voice of God or the messages of the angels or the singing of the redeemed in heaven. We can't hear that. But God does speak. He has not been silent. 
In the beginning, God spoke. Every time that he said, let there be, it came into being through that word. Light and sun and moon and stars, seas and ground, sky, plants, birds, fish, reptiles, insects, mammals, and a human being. Speaking through his word, God built a universe, God created life. Let's keep going. Immediately after that first sin happened and the first people were hiding from him in the bushes, God spoke, where are you? When God was grieved that he had created human beings, God told Noah to build an ark to get his family through the waters. God told Abraham that he would make of him a great nation, and Abraham believed God, and that faith was credited to him by God as righteousness. When God's people were enslaved in Egypt, God sent Moses to deliver God's word to Pharaoh, to let God's people go. And with all of God's people gathered at the foot of Mount Sinai, in a thunderous voice, God spoke his commandments so the people could know what's right and could know what's wrong and know that they needed to repent. When Elijah was hiding in a cave, God did not speak to him in the wind or in the fire or in the earthquake. In the silence, God asked him, What are you doing here? When God's people had turned to fake gods, God appeared in the temple and asked Isaiah, Whom shall I send and who will go for us? God told Jonah to go to Nineveh and warn the people there that they would be facing God's judgment. And when they repented and Jonah complained about it, God had some stern words for Jonah's hard heart. God has not been silent. We have his words. Then God sent his son in the fullness of time. All of those things that God had been wanting to say to us, everything that we need to hear from him, he put in flesh and bone and blood with a human face and a human voice. God is a God who speaks. He has so much to say to us, and he said it in person. So much that Jesus has told us. And just listen to some of these words and consider what it means about who Jesus is and why he's here. Come to me, all who labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Take heart, it is I. Do not be afraid. Where are your accusers? Neither do I condemn you. Now go and leave your life of sin. I go to prepare a place for you. Father, forgive them for they know not what they're doing. Today you will be with me in paradise. I'm very thankful God's word did not stay in heaven. God's word came to earth in person. God was not silent. God has so much to say to us. Some of my confirmation students sometimes complain that this book is so big. I'm thinking, I'm surprised it's not a whole lot longer. And you know what? I would soak it up if it was I don't care how big it is. But I treasure these words. One day, Jesus and his disciples crossed the borders and they were outside of the Jewish country. There, a Canaanite woman came to Jesus. And according to the cultural rules, she should not have done that. This was considered a bad thing for her to do. In Jewish eyes, she was an outsider, a Canaanite. And her people had been the enemies of the Jews For centuries, who was 
she, one of those people to come to Jesus. And plus, considering the way people thought then, she was a woman. And there were strict rules about Jewish men speaking with any woman. And yet she dared to break that rule. Somehow, from someone, she had heard about Jesus, even though she was outside of the borders. And that word led her to Jesus face to face. And she called out to him. So what did she have? What could she bring to Jesus? Well, she had herself. She had a daughter who was in desperate need. And she had the word of God. At least she had a little crumb of that word. But that word, no matter how small it was, let her know who Jesus is. And that word motivated her to approach him. You know, it would be normal to have doubts about herself. It would be normal for her to wonder if she had any right to come to Jesus. Why should anybody like her be able to ask anything of Jesus? I mean, she's a woman, she's an outsider, she's a foreigner, she's a nobody. When it came to this same text, Martin Luther said, For it is no joke when conscience tells us you have no right to pray. You don't belong to Christ. Let St. Peter and St. or let St. Paul and St. Peter pray, but our Lord God won't listen to you. You have no faith, or probably not among the elect, and not and not worthy to be eligible for and deserving of stepping before God to ask him anything. And with such thoughts and troubling doubts, the devil assaults us and jabs at us. So who should this Canaanite woman listen to? Those voices that were telling her that she had no right to come to Jesus? Or should she listen to the word of God that invited her to come to him? Who are you going to listen to? Who do you want the children in your family, and in the community here to listen to? And who is going to teach us and teach them the Word of God, even if it is just one crumb at a time, one crumb after one crumb after one crumb? Because she took that tiny little crumb of hope that she'd gotten from the Word of God, and she held onto it tightly, and she brought her words of need to Christ. We can also admit that we come to God before Jesus without any high status, without any claim on his mercy, without having proven that we deserve to be heard. We can admit to him, everything scripture says about me is true. I am a sinner and God owes me nothing. If anything is left to me to receive what I deserve or what have made the effort to earn, then I am certainly lost. However, here is Jesus, my Savior, my Redeemer, crucified for me and risen for me. Where else can I go? Who else can I turn to? He has the words of eternal life. In that humility, she trusted God's word and she approached Jesus. In verse 26, Jesus broke his silence and told the Canaanite woman, it is not right to take the children's bread and throw it to the dogs. Don't take that as a compliment. It isn't. I like dogs, but this is not a compliment. The good part of what Jesus was saying, was that he had come to bring good news to the Jews. That's good. The bad part was that it would be wrong to throw that good news to her as a Canaanite. 
She had a response. And Jesus heard her. Yes, Lord, yet even the dogs eat the crumbs that fall from their master's table. You know, so yes, the description of that was not complimentary to her. But she didn't seem to take offense at it. It didn't slow her down at all. She knew that she was not Jewish, not born into God's chosen people. Instead, she was a descendant of those who had fought to prevent the Jews from coming into the promised land. She was a descendant of those people who had horrible, horrible religious practices, even sacrificing little children in the name of their horrible, made-up gods. She knew that she could not deserve Christ's mercy because of his ethnicity. Yes, God had chosen to work through the Jews, not through the Canaanites. She did not protest that she should receive his mercy because she was just a good mother who was trying everything she could to help her child. She did not make promises that if he would only help her daughter, then she would straighten out her life. She did not argue that she'd done many good things with her life and she should be rewarded for it. She did not ask him how much money it would take or how many sacrifices she should make in order to get Jesus to do this for her. So she didn't even try any of those things that human religions would demand of her. She did none of the things that come to our human minds to try to motivate God on our behalf. As a student of scripture, Martin Luther is quoted as saying, God is the God of the humble, the miserable, the afflicted, the oppressed, the desperate, and those who have been brought to nothing. That describes this mother and not only her. She knew that as a Canaanite and as a woman, she was looked down on. She knew that she had no right to approach Christ at all or expect anything from him. She knew that there was nothing in her that deserved or merited or could earn any mercy. So she could not depend on herself, not on her own holiness or her own righteousness or her own good works. But instead of depending on herself, she depended on Christ. And you know, that's actually a hard thing to do. But for this Canaanite mother, there was no bargaining, no arguing, no disputing. There's a genuine humility in her. And I was wondering as I was looking through this, how could she know scripture so much better than some of the people of God's own chosen people? Like this verse. He has shown you, O man, what is good and what does the Lord require of you, but to act justly, to love mercy, and to walk humbly with your God. So she was an outsider according to ethnicity and according to history. But her humble faith in Christ meant that she was an insider to God. And like so many Jews whose prayers were answered by Christ, he answered hers too. Because Jesus had come for the lost sheep of Israel. And you know, it's really heartbreaking that so many of them continued to scatter away from this good shepherd. And here is this one lost sheep from outside the borders who came to him and followed him and trusted him. Somehow the word had reached her and she had rushed to him. Jesus said that her faith was great. But her faith was not based on what she'd seen. She didn't know the outcome in advance. She accepted whatever Jesus told her, and she clung to him tightly. So we really don't know if her faith was weak, strong, shaky, or solid, big or small. I don't think she's worrying about that at all. But great faith is very simply 
faith that holds on to Jesus, our great Savior. And that kind of faith comes from hearing the Word of God. And to hear it, somebody has to teach it. So yes, she would have a low status in Jewish eyes, like a Canaanite dog. God's Word shows us that her actual status in the eyes of God was as his daughter, a member of God's family, by faith in Christ. For her, Jesus is the Messiah, the son of David, who had come to earth in order to give his life to save her. Jesus came to save sinners, like her, like her daughter, like us, to rescue people who have gotten lost from him because of our sin, to bring outsiders into the family of God, not by ethnic group, not by their own actions, not by their own efforts, not by their own wealth, not by their own sacrifices, but through the blood of Christ. It takes humility to recognize that as good news and to rely on it. It offends our human ego, and that's a good thing. It leads the sinner to repent and to trust God's mercy for us in Christ. So Jesus did hear her. Jesus did hear us. So repent, because our sins do hinder our prayers. Admit it, because it's arrogant to think otherwise. Sins are serious. Fortunately, we don't have to hold on to them. And in a couple of weeks, pretty soon, you'll be starting Sunday school. And that's about getting that word into people's lives. And you do not need a radio to tune into him. You don't need expensive equipment to make yourself heard in heaven. You have his word. It's available. I've been in churches where there aren't any Bibles in the pews, or I couldn't find one anywhere. Fortunately, you have them with you. And I'm pretty sure you have some at home. If you don't, I'll get you one. But this word we teach to our children and we keep on learning it as adults. And we rely on it. His word is a precious gift from God's grace and God's mercy through Christ alone. Amen. Let us pray. Heavenly Father, thank you for showing us who you are, what you're like, what you do. Thank you, Father, for somehow your word reaching this Canaanite woman from across the border, not one of God, your chosen people. And yet, she trusted that word. She was drawn by that word to Jesus to bring her need to him. And Father, may we be more like her. Thank you that Jesus has come to seek and to save the lost. Thank you, Father, that even though we get ornery, we wander off on our own way. Your word calls us back. And Father, as we teach your word, help us to be faithful. Help us to rely on your word so that our children, our children's children, the people in our neighborhood, in our community, they could know Jesus more and more and rely on him more and more and come before you not in themselves, but just holding on to the Savior, Jesus Christ. Let your word reach people, Father, for we pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. At this time, we will receive the offering.
Well, let's remain standing as we bow our heads and bow our hearts before God and lift our prayers to him. Heavenly Father, thank you that there need be nothing that hinders our prayers. That when we lift our voices to you, we can have the confidence that you hear us, that you know our words, you take them to heart. So Father, teach us to repent. And as we do pray to you, teach us that humility, that we come before you as a, really as a trusting child, coming before a, a loving parent, a loving father. Thank you for clearing out those obstacles to get in the way. Hear us when we pray. And Father, we pray for your blessings on this congregation, your blessings on this community. Be here, guide people, protect people, remind people of who you are and, and why people need to trust you. And let your word reach out from your congregations and from all the people who love you and trust you so that everyone can hear that word and some of them can come to faith and lives and attitudes and priorities can be changed to reflect you. Father, please hear us as we ask for your guidance for the call committee here. Prepare the way. Bring the right shepherd at the right time here, Father. Watch over those whose health is a concern to us and even more so to you. Bless Connie, Alan, Dave, Judy, Annie, Karen, and Christy. Father, be with and encourage and guide our residents at nursing homes and assisted living. You think of Edna and Helen and Marjorie. Father, watch over and protect those who are serving in our military as they serve to keep us free and safe. Watch over Aaron Buckles and his friends and those who stand at his side. Father, and watch over our veterans too as they've served their countries, even at great cost to themselves and to a lot of their friends. But Father, be with them and encourage them and let them know that their service is appreciated. Father, bless our country and guide us and change what needs to be changed so we reflect your ways better and better. Watch over our political leaders and our leaders in the, in the churches. Watch over the police and bless their service and protect them. Watch over our communities and bring a, a peacefulness, a neighborliness, and helpfulness. And Father, we pray for a revival based on your word because your word does bring that fruit of the spirit to people's lives. It does change our attitudes and our hearts and makes us, it actually it does make us better citizens and better neighbors. But mostly, Father, it's simply because people need to know you and a peace that's beyond any understanding in this world. Father, watch over those who are affected by tragedies. Watch over those affected by the fires in Hawaii. Watch over those who are facing a hurricane there in Southern California where they are not used to that. Prepare them, Father, and protect them. And Father, we pray for gentle rains at the right time to come here. Watch over all of us, especially the farmers, during this time of dryness and this time of heat. Then Father, also watch over the firefighters as they could have a busy week here. And Father, for our, in our association, watch over our home missions department, the pastors, the congregations, there's something wonderful happening there by Des Moines and actually in all of our home missions congregations. And Father, let them be of service to you and to reach into the places where you've set them with your good word. And Father, also watch over our missionaries around this world. We think of Johnny Sliver down in Brazil and what a blessing she is to all of those children who need that love. So bless her service there with those wonderful children. Thank you, Father for hearing us. Be present here and in our homes and everywhere we go. Teach us to rely on you as the one true God. So thank you, Father. And thank you 
that when Jesus was here on earth, one of the things that he shared with us was that perfect prayer. And Father, as we repeat the words that he said, this is our prayer from our minds and hearts and souls to your ears. We pray, our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. Now receive the benediction. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face to shine on you and be gracious to you. The Lord lift up his countenance upon you and give you peace. Our closing hymn is number 559, Great is Thy Faithfulness. I'm glad we're singing it here because I had to walk out on the, over at the Faith. So <laughs> I'm glad I can sing it with you. It's one of my favorite hymns. Number 559, Great is Thy Faithfulness. <laughs>